Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've done for us, and... Right, you know that pause, don't you? Yeah? The children are praying, and they know they should be saying thank you. They should say thank you, shouldn't we? Yes, I'm sure. Yeah. Mum puts a dinner on the table in front of you, and thank you, but you will as well, otherwise there'll be trouble. And uh, we know we're supposed to be thankful, we're supposed to be grateful, okay? That's, that's, that's the deal, isn't it? But, you know, you do hear those prayers, you do hear those prayers and go, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all you've done for us, and... And there's a pause. What? What has he done for you? I'm talking just in the ether. I'm talking, what's he done for me? Okay, personalise the whole thing, because that's the way it works. What's he done for me that I'm grateful for? Uh, it's good. It, I'm sure you're very glad now that during our prayer time, there was plenty of feedback about good stuff we can say thank you for, okay? But in general terms, what is that? Stuff we're grateful for. Above and beyond, like healing Auntie Gladys's big toe and looking after Flopsy the rabbit at the vets, right? Those are very important things, okay? But beyond and above that, what are the controlling passions and gratitudes of our life? Arguably, we need to get a little bit beyond the subjective and arguable things to bigger, more objective, cosmic things for greater assurance and for greater stability. And for greater gratitude. What am I talking about? I can see it on your faces. Paul's trying to get these weakened Colossian Christians, okay, to be grateful for what God's done for them. And the reason is they're vulnerable. And why are they vulnerable? Well, their gratitude to God has started to slip. Their gratitude for God's free grace in Christ has started to slip. Now, remember how we were reconstructing the situation. They're living in Colossae. Colossae was a, a place that was on a trade route down the Lycus Valley until they moved the road north. Remember that bit? And when they moved the road north, the jobs went north as well, didn't they? Yeah? So poverty came to the place. They were a place in recession. And of course, what happens to places in recession? All the young people leave. Does that happen in Monday? <laughs> oh, does it? And they all leave and they find jobs somewhere else. And all those kids who put all that effort into with Sunday school and youth work and all the rest of it, and now, in the big churches, in our version of it, on the southern coastal plain. Yeah? That's the way it works. And when that sort of thing happens to you, it's very, very easy to get very ungrateful. Ask me how I know about this. I'm an expert. Because you put a lot of time and effort and energy into something, and then they all clear off. And they're gone. And it's great, because they're doing great things all over the place. But still... Now that's what's going on in Colossae, and gratitude is at a low ebb. So when somebody comes along offering you extra, the Colossian heretics, they were the ones who came and said, we'll give you extra. Yeah. So when somebody comes along offering you extra, you're up for it, because you want more, because you're ungrateful. Does that make any sense? Okay. Paul is trying to get these Colossian Christians, these weakened and wavering Colossian Christians, to draw closer to Christ once again. And their gratitude for their objective privileges in Christ is going to be crucial to that. So first of all, first of all, weeks ago, Paul addressed their distance from Christ and he encouraged them back in the union with Christ. And then he went on from there and warned them about the hollow philosophy and highlighted the superior or authentic Christianity to that extra they were being offered. Jesus is the best. And now he turns to highlight him what Christ has done for them in terms of utterly cosmic significance and saying, be grateful for that. Be glad for that. Live with gratitude in your hearts for the big things that God has done in and for you. What things? One, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ, isn't he? Only for starters. Secondly, he forgave us all our sins. That's a bit unusual. Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he's taken away, nailing it to the cross. Thirdly, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over the vice cross. You were dead, God made you alive in Christ. You were condemned, he forgave you by the cross of Christ. You were enslaved to demonic powers and authorities, and he made a public spectacle of them, vanquishing them by Christ's cross. Three huge things to be thankful for. 